Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the new show. We have no idea what we're going to call it yet, but my name is Jason, and on the other end of this thing is Keith. Say hello, Keith. Hello, Keith. How are you today? We, we actually we, we had a long conversation yesterday. We wasted a bunch of topics. We did. We're not going to have the same energy now. Nobody heard it but us. I know, but it was a good conversation. It was a great conversation. We, um, we are we, like are many- Are we going to rehash that? We, we should, well, we're definitely going to rehash the Tiger King part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. But uh, so we should probably explain what we're doing. So, in an effort to um, keep us from going crazy, we are recording for I don't know however long we want to record each day or, or however long we want to do this, and uh, just talking about things as we're cooped up like many of the millions of Americans are and millions of people, I guess, across the world as we fight Godzilla. No, it's not Godzilla. It's uh, not, not Godzilla at all. It's, no, it's, uh, it's El but Coronavirus. It is, it is pretty, you know, you have to take it seriously. Right. And you do. So. And so we're all social distancing and staying home, some more than others. And we are uh, trying to find ways to keep our interests and take our time. So Keith and I were throwing out the idea at work one day that maybe we should do a podcast. And because we always have these great I- conversations about stuff. Usually it's like sports, though, or a few other things. I've never done a podcast, so I'm really interested to see how this goes. But you have broadcasting, so you, you know what you can talk. That's great. So you have a broad. So you, it's not like you'll just go and I'll go blah 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 blah, and you'll go yeah. You know, it won't be like that. It'll be like, you know, we'll just keep talking. So Worst interview ever, right? So our, our yeah. job is to uh, talk about shit and to keep you uh, – I said shit. I will let that go. Wait, wait, wait. I was going to – well, can we cuss? Yeah, we can cuss. We can cuss. We'll uh, make sure we adjust we that on, on the Apple iTunes filter when we uh, when we do this thing. So, uh, yeah, we can cuss a little bit. Oh. So, um, we uh, we wanted to bring you a few things. We wanted to keep you entertained. We have no sponsors. We have no druthers. We are not putting on airs. This is J and K Raw. That's not going to be the title of the podcast because that that's just sounds like an adult film that for intended like for alternative game. audiences. However you want to say it. <laughs> But uh, we're, we're not. We're, we're, we're going to call it something. We'll figure it out when we uh, post it up to Apple later tonight and uh, put it elsewhere. So one thing I promise is that we will have fun. We'll right. laugh at each other we and we'll laugh yesterday. at what we're talking about. Right. And uh, we'll just have a good time. And hopefully, anybody listening will too. So Keith, Keith's work computer just signed out. I heard it. That's it the, sure the, did. Three sure beeps, signed off. Yeah. The three beeps of a federal computer going to sleep is 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 distinctive to my ear after my time in VA and and now uh, here. <laughs> so, so just so you know, also Keith and I are in two completely separate locations, but we're in Europe, so you know we not so bad. But uh, he is like probably eleven miles, twelve miles from where I am because he is socially distanced, and I am socially distanced in my. Third floor studio, um, surrounded by a lot of shit I need to clean up. I really need to clean my studio. It is, it's in a bad way right now. Uh, so we are socially distanced. We are both negative for coronavirus at this time. We're both healthy, wealthy, and wi- well, wise. We'll, we'll skip wealthy, but um, I think the big yeah. thing, obviously the big thing everybody's talking about, Keith, is Tiger King and this thing on Netflix about the guy who... Yes. Right, right? And yes. so this hurts you more because as an Oklahoman... Right? Did I do that? Is, is there another? Is that Oklahoma? Is that the right term? I'm, a, I'm an Okie. Yes. Right. I'm an Okie. Okie. And, so they're uh, Okie. proud of it. That's right. I went too formal. Uh, but as I, I put the as tuxedo I on the citizenry, didn't I? The... You did. That was my bad. <laughs> so you're an Okie. Yes, Tell me more about that. I'm an, well, I, you know, it's uh, like Texas. You know, you're proud to be a Texan. I'm proud to be an Okie. And for all that stands for. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think Oklahoma is just full of. Great college football, at least in the center of the state. I've never thought that. And uh, and meth. And now <laughs> it's uh, more known for a guy and a few people who collected uh, uh, big cats and sold tickets to come see these big cats and then just went to hell in a handbasket from there. King of the Weirdos, it's it's the new title. Wow. It's like it's become Oklahoma has become Florida man. That guy is such a Florida man. How that didn't happen in Florida is beyond me. Well, it did. That's the thing. Huh. It traveled to Florida. Okay. If you know the story, you know he the the his nemesis, that bitch Carol Baskins right. is Florida, so he actually uh, wanted somebody allegedly, allegedly. to kill her 
uh, in Florida. So it has a, a crazy Florida man tie to it. It's so strange. So how much, you know, you said you grew up in the more sane part of Oklahoma where, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the Toby Keiths of the world and all of that grew up and all that near Oklahoma City, I guess. Right. Or no. That is the only person from Oklahoma you can name, isn't it? it right. at the You named like 65 in your email <laughs> and I totally forgot all of them. Well, no, James I, Garner. I, I James said, Garner, I'm, I know because he's a huge Oakland Raiders fan, or was, I should say. So I, I know James Garner, and I had forgotten Brad Pitt is an Oklahoman, but I think he moved to like Arizona when, as he was growing, or something like that. Maybe not. Um, but I no, forgot he, he was Oklahoma. He yeah, he got out. His family got out. Well, his family's still there. Right. Uh, around Shawnee area. I'm just going to name drop now. Oh. Uh, but, you know, I'm from the the same Garth Brooks, Toby Keith, Reba McIntyre, James Garner, uh, Tommy Franks, you know, that kind Tommy of Franks. Oklahoma. And not the meth dealing, <laughs> no teeth in your head, go home and brush your tooth. <laughs> part of Oklahoma. How did we get back so, to meth dealing? That was fast. Man, well, that's, again, you know, it's, uh, I, I honestly believe without going on my computer here that that uh, Oklahoma may be certainly in the top five right. of meth dealing states in the country. So, here we are. I know that uh, comedian Kathleen Madigan has often said Missouri is definitely in the top three um, and uh, by all statistics, supposedly Kansas, of all places, was leading that uh, meth-making, dealing sorts of... But but anyway, so these guys, though, were out in the boonies, right? They're, they're Tiger Farm. I, okay, so full disclosure, I've seen about 25 minutes of one episode. I, I'm sort of holding off because I'm really enjoying the reaction from social media and everybody else just that... Everybody's going, holy shit, these people are crazy, that kind of thing. And But, you know, it's that kind of crazy that only comes along every once in a while. And as a writer, it's one of those things that just, it totally vilifies or it totally, what's the word I'm looking for? It totally um, brings to light that statement that truth is stranger than fiction. And, uh. I, I mean, it's just, it, it's a total weirdo show. And I don't know. How much of it have you seen? I've seen the whole thing. All right. Uh, and, it, you know, it starts off going, oh, well, this is, you know, I've heard of him. And we'll get into this in a little bit. But the dude not only ran for governor, uh, but ran for president. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so you go there and you go, okay, it starts off. They, the, the producers weren't even looking to do a story on him. Right. They were actually following snake sales. Oh, really? As opposed to big cat sales. Yeah, that's the first thing you see is is they're in this place that sells venomous snakes, snakes. and large snakes. Why did it have to And be they snakes? go out, they're almost done, and hey, this guy goes, hey, let me show you this. And he's got a lynx in a cage in a hot van. So that started down that, better or worse, rabbit trail. The crazy roller coaster and, starts going up the hill. Right. And then it ends up in Winniewood, Oklahoma, a town of less than 2,300 people, wow. which I want other. I want everybody listening, You know, every two people that are going to listen to this when I share it. Six. We always say uh, six. 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 Will, six, six, will six. six. Okay. At least six. That, uh, you know, know that it's only a town of 23, less than 2,300 people. Don't say that's a... That's but it's a, got like a post office and a zip code, right? And a government? And I mean, a, it's got like a town probably, council? Yeah, and probably a Casey's general store. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Is that the big so, store yeah. in Oklahoma, Casey's? Yeah, well, Casey's loves... Do you have like a uh, Wawa? What's the big convenience also, store? What was the big what? Convenience store of Oklahoma. Well, it there's loves. Okay. There's on cue. Because like in, there's, um, at, uh, in, in Georgia, it was Quick Stop. That was my favorite. Or not Quick Stop. What was it? Um, it began with a Q. I said Quick Stop from a uh, friggin' um, <laughs> the Kevin Smith movie, but it was it begins with a Q. I forget what it is, but it, it was by my um, uh, sister in law's house. That was my favorite. But I wasn't sure if Oklahoma had like a Quick. famous store that wasn't like an oil drilling area. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, if you uh, if you see the yellow loves sign, a lo okay, you're. You're well in Oklahoma. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. So this place is is really small, and and he decide. I guess they discover that they have these cats there, and is that where like the zoo was, the circus was? Because it seems like if you're gonna go crazy and charge people to look at tigers, you'd want to be in a more populated place. Well, you would think, but you know, he he's from this town, and that's just where he homesteaded, I guess. Yeah. 
uh, to use another Oklahoma term. Good one. And, uh, but he, he just started buying these cats right. and started breeding them and built cages and pens and, and things like that. Now, you mentioned Hugo. Hugo, Oklahoma is way down south, south central. And Hugo is known to be the winter homes of several of these um, not Barnum and Bailey circuses. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you may be down in one of these places around Hugo and hear elephants and hear tigers and lions and and see some people that you go, hmm, I wonder if they're in circuses. But not necessarily near Winniewood. I have actually been to Winniewood once um, back in the uh, early 90s when I worked in radio and was calling – uh, football, play-by-play football for high school football. The team I was covering, the Hollis Tigers, right. uh, played in Winniewood. So I was in Winniewood. I didn't see anything because I was there after dark. It right. was at the football stadium and then got the hell out. But uh, So that's that's about it. So I you're, mean, saying, like, you're saying Hugo is kind of the nerve center for carnies? Is that what it, that's what it sounds like? <laughs> I can't confirm nor deny that. <laughs> So, uh, and, and not to go so, off yeah. on another tangent, but as I recall from my American history, isn't Oklahoma like where they, they said, okay, basically they, they st- stood on the border of, I'm trying to think what's, what's right next to Missouri, Missouri, yeah, Arkansas, okay, so on the border of Missouri, sort of facing West. Right. And they said, okay, basically take your stage coke and the uh, stage coach and go. And the first, first 40 acres you find are yours. Something like that. Right. Isn't that the whole idea of homesteading in the first place, or what? I recall that. Well, yeah, and, and that's why we're called the Sooner State, right. because you hear about the Great Land Rush yeah. of, uh, I believe it was 1905. That's my it. Ameri- that's what my I'm Oklahoma of. history teacher yep. would be upset. Uh, and, you know, you just go out and you find a plot of land, like on a, a river bank or mm-hmm. something like that, and you stake it out. Right. And the, the way the Sooner name came about is people left before the actual, the cannon was fired. So uh, well, they but, would go out s- sooner. So that's how it comes out. Now it's just a great football team. But um, great is so that's that's the way it came out. So yeah, you have a little bit of the history there. And I just looked on a map. Winniewood is about an too. hour. I want to look too. Hang on. Hour hour and a half south of Oklahoma City, almost straight down I thirty right. five towards Dallas. Okay, so it's but it's still a ways from Dallas, right? How how's this W E E N W O D or something? Yeah, there it is. I found it. W Y N N E. And it's pronounced Winniewood. Winniewood. Well, it has a urgent care and a shell and a Trails End barbecue. So I guess that's something. Oh yeah, there well, it is, right off the thirty-five, uh, just north of Gene Autry, Oklahoma. Uh, that's interesting. But yeah, all right. So it's sort of in the middle of uh, no man's land between Oklahoma City and Dallas. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Yes. All right. So anyway, um, I thought it was like a lot. I thought it was like stuck up like in the Panhandle or something. But it's it's kind of near civilization. I mean, if if you're bored in Oklahoma City one day, like my friends Jennifer and Rob might have been one day, they probably <laughs> might have taken a drive to Winniewood and seen these cats, right? So you were saying that they they came in to do a story about snakes and they discovered this lynx. Of course, since I haven't seen the documentary, I have to ask. And then what happened? Well, they found out where did you get the lynx. And that led to a, a bunch of breeders, sellers, and they ended up in Winniewood, Oklahoma. Right. Uh, fun fact, uh, as they, the, not, not two minutes, not three minutes into the first episode, if you watch that, you saw as they go by on the highway, there's a sign in the shape of Oklahoma, and it has a paladin on the sign, and it shows a, uh, uh, the, plant for BAE who makes the paladin yep. Yep. uh which is the M109 paladin which is a mobile artillery piece so they were literally right at Elgin Oklahoma which is 6 miles from Fort Sill yep. which is where I spent the last 14 yep. years yep. so of course I'm looking this is going to make Oklahoma look bad what the hell oh of course they show you know right there the Elgin plant which brings all kinds of economy in the southwest. Oklahoma. Huge. I mean, it's got to be like a thousand jobs, right? It's it's close to that. Yeah. yeah. And then and and oh, by the way, it's 
you know, almost 100 miles away, 70 miles away from Winniewood. Right. But, of course, that sign with the Paladin on it makes it look cool. Yeah. So, of course, that's why the producers used it. All right. So, you know, the thing that, that keeps seems to be popping up in everybody's conversations are, are like the tangent things. Like, um, like the wife fed her ex-husband to a tiger, probably, right? The, the, wherever she is. And then... You know, they're, they're just the amount of sort of I, I, the what I watched in twenty five minutes. I was just like these. This is like Breaking Bad. These characters seriously cannot exist in 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 a book because nobody would believe that you wrote them this way. It's like nah, these are too implausible. But like I saw the one with the guy, and he's like uh, he rushes in the office and said, "I'm done doing business with you" because he he spent like eighty five thousand dollars on campaign material. And I think the thing that surprised us the most. Or that surprised me in watching the show wasn't necessarily that you know he he uh, he was uh, you know he had a, a same sex marriage uh, 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 that was surprising twice. given you know twice given Oklahoma yeah, but trouble. you know people are people I dig that whatever uh, it wasn't that that some of these people that he was associating with were definitely sketchy it was and this is it and I, and I, I need you to to give me a hug on this one Keith it's that he ran for fucking governor and he got twenty percent of the vote no no he didn't. I he thought, got nineteen percent. Well, I rounded up. But okay, it's to, yes, yes, it's you're baffling right. to and me. I was, I was there for that. You were okay. And, and holy shit, yeah. I mean, I, I really don't know what to say about that. Yeah, he got nineteen. Nineteen percent of the that's vote. like if you had hundred people in the room, twenty of them said, "I want that batshit crazy motherfucker right over there." That's what I want. Yes. And yes. And, and so and but the, so the, the 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 other piece that I saw was apparently this other guy who had been his partner in the business. Um, he would been in prison for committing some sort of felony, got out, and uh, Joe, right? That's the guy's the guy's name, Joe. He had spent like eighty five thousand dollars of the other guy's money on campaign stuff, and the other guy didn't like that at all. Like didn't like, like that. At like all. he said nope. in the documentary, right? That I would kill him if I saw him. I mean, there was no question. It was it was it was hands down. He was going to kill him dead. Yes, it, and it was and but not only that, Joe was the guy that came in. Mr. Moneybags, right. and then all of a sudden, well, I don't have any money, right. or I'm backing out of the deal. Right. He not only did that to Joe Exotic, he did it to uh, Jeff. Jeff is the guy we're talking about. Uh, and yeah, Jeff, Jeff. Did yes, it yes, to, yes, yes. Uh, I can't think of the other guy's name, but they had broken ground and started grading ground right. near the largest casino in Oklahoma, which again is in Thackerville, just across the border from Texas. I've actually heard and of they this. Were they were going to move the park... Uh, the zoo, if you will, down there to take advantage of all the traffic coming into the casino. Right. And then all of a sudden Jeff said, ah, I'm done. I don't want to do this. Mm. And left the, the other guy who was another breeder, uh, another guy hanging. So, you know, I guess the question you and I should ask ourselves is, is why did this, we watch it? No, no. We know why we watch it. It is compelling in a lot of ways. But would this thing have done so well if all of us weren't cooped up in our homes and although Netflix and chill is sort of passe now, if we weren't basically forced to watch what was on Netflix or what was on TV or whatever, and this is what kept popping up, and after a while you just go, all right, you give in, and then in about 10 minutes in, you're like, holy shit, this is the best thing I've watched since, you know, whatever. <laughs> right? You I know, mean, what do you think? It's interesting because uh, you, you and I both know that the younger generation, uh, <laughs> the gener <laughs> you know, <laughs> they they have cut the cable and they've, you know, they rely a lot on Netflix. Right. So would this have happened uh, without being quarantined and, and social distancing and all that? Right. I still think it would have happened. I don't know that there would have been a Facebook of uh, Tiger King memes. No, no. It's, and all that. It, that's all that's on my Facebook right now. Right. And I, I don't know if this was – it must have been released while we were all sitting at home because if it had been on before, we would, would have at least heard inklings of it. But somebody said, you know what? Nobody's doing at home doing anything. Let's just let this thing go now and see what it does. And they're probably like, hoo, hoo more of that. But I think you know yeah. the documentary people – documentary. Say that correctly, Jason. The documentary people – Glad you speak for a living. Yeah. How about that, right? They probably ran into a gold mine, like you said. Like they, they were going, it's how, and that's how it usually happens, right? In these situations, they're going for one thing, they discover another, and it's gold. Which is why, when you go through, remember we went through Dinfos and other schools, and they said, "Look, you're going to be asking questions on a story, but something else more interesting may come up, and you want to pursue that. Pursue that. It's usually more interesting." And I've that's that never failed, nugget. and that's, that's it. Right. This was definitely the gold nugget of of whatever, and it turned into. 
a holy shit bag of gold nuggets because it, it, it's it's apparently viewing gold. Well, and it's not just Joe Exotic. You know, as you go through that, you have. You have uh, the Jeff guy. What's going on with him? Right. The dude with, like, four teeth who apparently got his teeth fixed, and he was pissed off because uh, Netflix had footage of him getting his teeth fixed and sort of riding the ship for himself facially, and he's like, he was mad because, oh, Netflix didn't show that or something like that. I thought that was funny. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's Joe. That was one of the husbands, one of the, one of the thruple. Was it really? Okay. Yeah, and then, and then uh, Jeff is the guy that wears Dana... Plus the ball cap. Okay. And, and it tries to be a 50 something M&M, whatever. And, uh, uh, but so there was him, there were, you know, all the other breeders. Oh, and we haven't even mentioned mm-hmm. Doc Andel yet. No, I didn't Who is see- the guy in South Carolina who has a harem and a <sighs> cult down there and takes these young ladies in, buys them boobs. And lets them play with the uh, the exotic cats and pays them one hundred fifty or one hundred dollars a week. They live in a horse stall. They get their own horse stall though. I really need and to watch then, more TV. And then does whatever you know he wants them to do as long as they call him Lord. I really need to watch more TV. And, and I'm such a I, I'm such an idiot because I don't watch right. So I don't watch a lot of TV. A lot of this stuff I just tend to avoid. And and, and I just because. I don't know. It's not. I, I just. I don't watch TV. I can't think of another way to say it. It's not that I have a reason or another. I just. I'm never really compelled by this, and I'm finally compelled by this. So I've really got to catch up <laughs> on viewing this because well, most it, most of the time I like to watch. I'll throw on a movie I've seen a thousand times, or something like that. Something that that is familiar to me, right? And I will I will watch that, or I'll watch as you do sports. Like I'll, I'll put on sports all the time, but it's very very rare that a series will catch my interest and I'll watch it. And it's mainly because there are so many, like how many CSI series do we need? 83. I mean, CSI Winnie Wood is coming. It's got to be coming (laughs) as a result of this, right? I mean, but seriously, I've I've watched probably a half dozen, no, probably more than that, uh, just by accident, a dozen CSI episodes of New Orleans, Los Angeles, the regular one, wherever that's based, I'm guessing D.C., and it's the same melodramatic, you know, plot that it is each time. And if I wanted to watch that, I'll watch Columbo, I, you know, when they did it the first time, right? And so I, I just, I don't wow. get into TV too much. So this is this is kind of captivating to me because it's just so off the fucking end bonkers that I, I, I've got to really I've got to breathe it in and, and take it in, you know. Now, for you, those of you that are listening to us talk about the Tiger King, we haven't even mentioned Joe's. Joe Exotic's nemesis, that bitch Carol Baskin, who is a who Joe thinks you're the one who will get sued, by the way, for libel or slander, not me. All right, just just so we're. Going. I'm just quoting. I'm just quoting the the, the show. Okay, it's so just so everybody's know, clear, Car- we're we're quoting the show. Yes, yeah, right. Carol's not husband. Now this is opinion. this is was investigated by the police. Right. Carol's husband, first husband, who she met when she was 15. She got into a truck with him after he passed her twice, and he said, "Look, I can see you're you're, you know, in dire straits. Here, here's my gun. You hold it on me, so you know I'm not going to make do anything untoward. Right. And I'll take you, you know, get you some food or whatever. Untoward. So she met this. To the you're Keith word, so untoward. She met this guy when she was 15, had dropped out of the school, and gone to. Wherever it was, I don't even remember. Right. They got married. He was 32 years older than her. And come to find out, he's a multimillionaire. Ding! And then Score. later, later, I don't, I, again, I'm, I'm so captivated by this, I don't remember the numbers, but later, he goes missing. <laughs> Just goes missing. Yeah. Nobody hears from him. So that's the, yeah. the, uh, Hypothesis is that the tiger she him. fed him yeah. to one of her tigers. She has a, a place down in Florida that supposedly rescues big cats, right. and she hates Joe Exotic and what he was doing, yeah. but she's doing the same damn thing. Right. Where's her husband? And so that's the big yeah. thing. And I heard it was like the way she conducts herself in the special, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, she fed her husband to a tiger. There's no question in my mind. And that's where, and that's when I first started getting interested in this, right? Is I started seeing, 
what's her name again? Is it Carolyn or something like that? Carol. Carol Baskin. Carol definitely fed her husband to the Tigers. And I was like, all right, maybe I got to look into this. So Dee Dee, my wife, hadn't started watching it either. And so she started watching it like a couple nights. So I'm, I'm definitely, I'll, I'll, I will get on board with that. The last thing I watched of any sort of sustainment was The Pharmacist. Did you see that yet on Netflix? No. All right, it's way more serious, but I'll just, I'll, I'll try to do the 30 second synopsis. Essentially, it's how this pharmacy in Louisiana, of all places, became the sort of um, ground zero for the opioid crisis. And it sort of revolves around this one pharmacist, and he notices that all these people start coming in for opioid prescriptions, and he starts doing the investigation himself. I mean, God bless him. He was he was one of these people who was just tenacious, and he discovered that there's this clinic that's open at from like midnight to 5 a.m. that's issuing three to 400 opioid prescriptions a night, and it had a lot to do with opioid sales and everything. It's pretty good, and so that's – if you ever get a chance, do watch that. But this is another one of those things with the Tiger King, anyway. That's just it's just off the charts bonkers. So it's just to me, it's pretty funny. You're listening to the Untitled Jason and Keith podcast. I can't. That's as exciting as I can get it. That's that's the bump for the 20 minutes. We really nice. need to come up with a title next time. We we'll, we'll have a title or something. Let's leave it up to all of our listeners. What about day drinking? Just go day drinking with Jason and Keith. I like that because I am drinking a Coke Zero right now. I'm drinking a Diet Pepsi. See that those count. I think that counts okay. as uh, day drinking. I so I don't know how exciting so, that is for. Anybody. So have you watched the whole yeah. thing? And did you see anybody you know? Yes, as a matter of fact. No I shit. Did. All right, and not in the way you would think, but uh, in a former life, I was a TV reporter. Yes, and uh, the job I left at Fort Sill, as Robert I mentioned, Powell. to come here, I was uh, in charge of media relations for Fort Sill. So I worked with all of the media. Uh, in the local area, and anybody that wanted to come do a story on Fort Sill. So, yes, I saw five people I knew from local media, either in Oklahoma City or there in Lawton, which is, uh, like I said, about 70 miles away from uh, from the zoo there right. that Joe Exotic ran. So, right. so, yeah, they're friends. And, of course, uh, you know, I'm telling them, oh, they need an IMDb page now and – and all that, but uh, I'll tell you what, it's, it's uh, especially when it started getting really crazy, mm-hmm. when he was indicted for murder, uh, when he started running for, or when he ran for governor, uh, you know, he, he's not shy of cameras, 20, that's for sure. 20% of the vote. And Trevor Noah was saying that he thinks, which is funny, I just, I literally just heard this like an hour and a half ago, so my wife had put it on on her lunchtime. He thinks the guy is a perfect presidential candidate just based on all of the emotional and uh, the bias and uh, sort of everything that's going on in the world. It's not unthinkable that if that guy ran for president, he wouldn't get 20 to 21% of the vote, which would make Bernie Sanders pissed off because he just can't seem to do anything. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's just, it's it's nuts to, to, to think that, you know, and, and just, it, I don't know. It's just crazy. It's crazy to me. Crazy, I say. Crazy. Except for except for the conviction of a felony. Yeah, that would be the whole uh, felony thing. Yeah, I forgot about that. That, part. that would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. How long is he serving for? I forgot. Like twenty years. Twenty two years. 22. Yeah. Yeah. He got so he got uh, indicted on uh, uh, what trying to hire a hitman, mm-hmm. which is sketchy. Even the the uh, documentary says that that was kind of sketchy because the guy who he allegedly paid it was three thousand dollars. First of all, if you're hiring a hitman for three thousand mm. dollars, eh. that's a cheap uh, hitman. And then a couple that's of like other a, things. That's like a Love's store hitman. Well played, sir. Yes, sir. Well played. That's called a that's called a callback. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I think the the more serious charges and the ones that stuck really were they found uh, the bones of tigers on the on the land and okay, again yeah, I, I remember this carol baskins said hey i got a tip fbi that he's he's uh putting down tigers himself well he freely admitted he said yes when tigers get old and can't move and can't eat for themselves you have to euthanize them mm-hmm. and so they which, which sounds him. sane they they charged him with that too so 22 years and uh I, I never knew the guy, didn't know the guy, never right. been to his place. Funny, I was talking to somebody Sunday night right. that had been to his place. Oh, yeah? And, and she said that that same spiel you see him do on on camera is exactly what you get when you're there in person. 
So you see, so, see, there it is, Trevor. We're talking about authentic. You get what you you know. You see what you get. That's it's scary. Now the thing that that Didi brought up, we were talking about this yesterday, was it's the fact. And I don't know where you stand on this. Maybe you believe in this. Maybe you don't. I don't know you that well yet. I know you pretty well though. Uh, and since we can't golf, these are the things we have to do, right? Right. Um, is um, the the fact that you, that people are allowed to raise or keep or harvest animals like tigers legally for you know through some loophole they can have a in my you can't see it but i'm doing double bunny rabbits with my fingers zoo or whatever that thing is called that he has and keep these animals and that just seems ridiculous to me she said uh she was saying that uh i don't know if this is true but there are like more lions and tigers in captivity than there are in the wild right now or something like that and that's just baffling to me i mean it it makes perfect sense because human beings are just terrible but th- there's also this, this notion that in the United States, if I live in Oklahoma and I have the right permits, I could bring in tigers and have them live with me. And, you know, I may not know anything about caging tigers or doing whatever. And, it, you know, it, given everything else, the guy sounds like he knew how to handle tigers. But that said, it still sounds like a nutso situation to me. And I just it, it's very weird. It is. Now, you think about it, everybody says, oh, I'd love to have a tiger. Right. The problem is when you buy a, and that's the me, you know, a lot of the memes that are going around and videos, that, wait, I can get a tiger cub for $2,000? Right. I've got $2,000. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Right. And, but when you, you know, oh, they're, you know, they're great when they're, they're cubby and, and kitteny cubby. and all that, but then they grow into 300 and 500 pound beasts yeah. that, are still wild animals that has not been bred out of them yet. And even he on film got attacked and, yep. and that's why he walked with a crutch every once in a while because a tiger got a hold of him. And, you know, it just, it, it amazes me. And they say, he said it costs about $3,000 a month to feed the tigers he had. And I saw that they were eating like raw chicken and stuff. And I've heard more than one story about people who are like, who did, they were like, oh, I'm going to buy a tiger cub. And then like six months later, they're like, holy fuck, what am I going to do now? And, right. you know, they've got an actual tiger on their hands. They're going, I didn't think this was going to happen. You know, like some people believe that they buy a puppy and it's going to stay a puppy forever. And then it becomes like an annoying right. fucking mongrel animal that they didn't want in the first place. And they end up euthanizing it or taking it to a pound. It's like, how do you not know these things? How are you so naive not to know this, right? And it's just, it's stupid. And, and that's part of it. You know, feeding them, they would get roadkill from mm-hmm. the county. Mm-hmm. They would get... uh you know, whatever. But one of the biggest things that the film showed mm-hmm. was that uh, every day or every week, I guess it is, they would get from the local Walmart, they would get expired. But that's a that's a strong term because <laughs> when a customer like when milk takes, expires, yeah, when, when a customer takes meat off of the the cooler, out of the cooler, right, and for whatever reason, you know, has to leave, they have a fecal emergency or whatever and leaves the cart or they have to go home or they decide right. they can't pay for it okay. or whatever. Yeah. Once it leaves the cooler, they Walmart can't put it back in the cooler. Interesting. I didn't know so that. They, so they keep it separate in the back. And so once a week, the zoo would get this truck full of, of expired in quotes, your air quotes there. I did it again uh, just for you. Expired meat and feed the tigers because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to feed the tigers. So now, watching the film, you notice that none of those tigers were skin and bones. You couldn't see any of their ribs. Right. They all looked, at least from my novice point of view, pretty healthy. And the other thing is he didn't have just lions and tigers there. He had chimps and he had alligators. By the way, there's a, a part in an episode where the alligator barn, if you will, right. caught fire. It also housed the production studio for the guy that was filming a reality show, which is another whole separate issue of this whole thing. So now there's did he did Joe Exotic set the fire because he was said some things about Carol Baskins or did somebody else set the fire? This is like this is like Winnie Wood Kardashians, isn't it? Well, hang on. Okay, it gets better. Uh, the the alligators that were in the barn that died used to be owned. Wait for it. Hang on. By Michael Jackson. Holy shit! No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> 
Oh, I love it. It gets better and better. Now, see, I, I'm in. I gotta. I'll. I, I, I don't know when I'll have find the time, but I'm going to watch it. I mean, there's. I have you know, tons of time, obviously, but I, I. By the way, no new email, just so you're you feel better about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, my computer shut down. <laughs> there's no new email. There's nothing that's come in, so we're. It's been a, another quiet day, thankfully. Um, yeah. It, that, so now we got a Michael Jackson game. Good enough for me. I'm. I'm totally in. <laughs> Well, you're an L.A. guy, so there you go. I am an L.A. guy. And so the other thing that's been interesting about L.A. is um, seeing pictures of empty streets and seeing pictures of, like, highways with very few cars right. on them. And, you know, we travel on the A6, or I do, pretty every day to come to work, which is the east to west uh, highway here in Germany that connects my job to my home. And it runs all through the, the, the country. And it's usually a mess, not a mess, it's, it's, it's usually much slower to drive. So normally, if I leave at, say, 7.30, I will make it at about 5 till, if I'm fortunate, if, that, if the area right near our exit isn't full of semi-trucks and a couple of other places, because it's, the, the, the route is normally crammed with, with truckers and, of course, every other American trying to get to their job on a military post and so on and so forth. And that damn speed trap. And, the, and that friggin' speed trap, which got me the other day. I'm not even going to talk about it. And I was doing 132 maybe, and it popped me in a 130 zone, but we won't even get into that. So um, uh -huh. it's been very strange to drive on that road, especially at night, because like when I did the town halls, this is a little insider baseball for you all, sorry, but I'll make sure he has a reference for this. When I did the town halls last week and I was coming home, there was nobody on my side of the road. And that was weird because there's always somebody either going back to France or going to uh, Hamburg, which is just west of my house or somewhere. There's always traffic. There was nothing on my side of the road. Now going the other way, there were some semi trucks and things like that. But my, my side, nothing. So it's very weird to me to see, and I'm a San Diegan really, but I mean, I've been to San Diego, LA is what I really call my sort of home. But seeing the LA roads as open as they are, um, just seeing the sort of uh, the ghost towns that places have become just in general uh, is pretty weird. And, and then some of the things that have popped up, like a lot of the problems that are happening now with my friends are, um, or a few of my friends now are travel problems, like Airbnb won't refund reservation type problems. Right, right. And so those are starting to happen more. But um, maybe we could, we could give folks an overview of kind of what life's like for us here. So right now, just so like many of you, um, I, well, Keith and I are fortunate, or well, Keith was fortunate till today, but we will get into that. <laughs> But we've both been fortunate to be able to actually we have been able to go to work at least every other day. And then we stay home every other day and we have the ability to get email and do some teleworking. Keith actually has more ability than I do because he can VPN in and he can do all his work. I know I'm not talking Greek to a lot of you because you understand telework. Um, but there are many, many people who cannot telework. They cannot even do anything. So they're just sitting at home. So I know that like on the weekends, Keith, and I don't know what you do to kind of stay sane, but like our routine is kind of we... At least on Saturdays, you know, we get up, we eat some food, we kind of hang out, um, we do a few things, we'll probably go on a walk, we come back, and then, like, our oasises have been commissary and BX. It's just one of those things where it's like, okay, we need to get out of the house, we need to not be in our house 24 hours a day, right? So we go to the BX, and we find something that's necessary to buy, and in, in the course of that, we'll walk around and see if there's anything else necessary we need to buy, mostly just to relieve stress, right? And that was the other thing that was weird, is going into the that mall, and there's just nobody there, right? Uh, and then the other piece of that is, what am I thinking of? Damn. Oh, the commissary. Well, the commissary has not been crowded at all. There's been plenty of food. There have been hits and misses on shortages. I don't know if they're what, – what's your favorite thing? I, well, Diet Pepsi, for one, which is the devil's liquor. But what's – is there any particular snack foods that they <laughs> they haven't had or, or – what do you think? Zebra cakes. Zebra cakes, that's right. For, for a diabetic, I love zebra cakes. Right, right. Did, but they've had them, right? They haven't run out. Uh, occasionally they run out, mm. uh, uh, but overall I've been able to get what I need. We've been kind of – I don't want to say pissed off. That's not the right word. We've been kind of irritated and disappointed. I'll explain disappointed in a minute. We were kind of irritated because they have uh, pomegranate seeds, and they had them in the main in the big commissary. You walk in, you go to the cooler, boom, they were right there. And pretty consistently, they've had them. And then all of a sudden, like right before right before this whole thing started, they just sort of stopped being there. 
So this happened consistently like two or three times. And one time we went twice in a week and they still weren't there. So I saw, I don't remember the guy's name, uh, the, the manager, the very nice manager who's on the radio on Mondays, right? And I said, hey, look, um, I, this is a minor thing, but my wife really loves these things. Uh, what, do I, what day do I need to come in to get them so that um, I can make sure that I can get two or three so she can kind of have them for the week? He says, no, no, don't do that. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to up the order and I'm going to make, make sure they come in. On, like he says, I think they come in on Mondays and Wednesdays. If you want to come in on those days, check. I said, great. Thank you so much. He was very attentive, right? So I go home. I tell my wife, I say, honey, I have solved the world's pomegranate seeds problem. We're going to be able to go to the commissary. You're going to be able to get what you want. She's like, cool. So needless to say, I go Monday, no pomegranate seeds. I go Wednesday, no pomegranate seeds. So I figure, okay, Friday, excuse me, I'm kind of burping. Sorry. Um, it's this Diet Coke. It's really going to my head. Um, so it's. I thought uh, I heard a cork pop, actually. But okay. <laughs> no, no cork yet. Uh, <laughs> so I go Friday, and there's none. And I'm just kind of like, okay, who. I, I don't want to talk to the guy again, but, you know, it's just one of those little irritants that's like, okay, I wish, wish it happened, but it's not that big a deal. But then the other things, you just sort of walk around. Like I saw uh, macaroni and cheese. There was a huge run on macaroni and cheese. And I think there still is a big run on macaroni and cheese. I don't know why that is. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. There were like four or five things. Oh, strawberry pop tarts. So Keith knows. <laughs> <laughs> Keith knows that I bring. I, I usually bring. Well, actually, I don't. Bring, I usually eat in the car, so I shouldn't say that. Keith knows that I have a strawberry pop tart on the way to work. I usually don't toast it. I just oh, I'm not, I'm not, eat it right, which is gross for some people, but I love it. Well, they were out, so I stood in front of the pop top part tart area like weeping going all right what am i going to do here you know and i switched to raspberry and i was fine but that was a weirdo one that was kind of out strawberry pop tarts right so what have you noticed what else aside from the golf course closing which still to me sound is strange uh, don't uh, get me started on given that, that you're I mean, in, even if trouble you, even if you're in a cart i mean just turn your heads you know left and right <laughs> you know and and breathe out of the co- – I don't know. I, I guess they figure everybody's going to congregate in the country or the 19th hole afterward, and they're all going to oh, – I guess. I yeah. Know. You know, that's part of it. But uh, going in and paying and exchanging money, you know, that kind of thing. I guess. But uh, going back to the commissary, you know, I, I'm not – it's just me. Thanks for bringing that out. All right. Uh, it's just me and – Don't be too uh, mean Although I'm now. looking. Um, anyway, no, I'm not. Uh <laughs> I got off track there. It's just me, so I don't buy a lot of groceries. Right. Um, and you're a pretty skinny guy I, anyway. But I, I watch other people. I'm a people watcher. Um, so you go in, and it could be anything from all of the orange juice is gone. Mm-hmm. Or the other day I was in there, there was steak, there was beef, there was pork, but all of the chicken was gone. Right. Yeah, and, that, and, and course, chicken has been there's, been, there's been a big run on chicken since this started. We were there Sunday, and most of the chicken was gone. It's uh, I, And again, it's not necessary. I saw a video. Actually, a friend of mine shot the video. She used to be an intern at, uh, uh, at Fort Sill. Mm-hmm. Now she's at Camp Humphreys in Korea. All right. And she shot a video of their garrison commander not yelling, but being stern with the line that was coming out of the commissary saying everybody needs to maintain their distance, their social distancing, right. don't crowd up, we'll, we'll get everybody in. We're only letting so many people in at a time to keep social distancing. So you bunching up at the door is not going to help. No. Now mind your manners and act like adults. Which you shouldn't have to say to adults, but you're right. And they have like, as, as I understand it, there are actual like platoons of soldiers I don't know if platoons are right size, probably, of soldiers like in Italy whose job it is is to tell you stay, you know, a meter apart or six feet apart or whatever it is, you know, or make sure you wash your hands before you come to the store. I just saw the story on AFN uh, last night, and I, I thought that was interesting. So it is interesting how this whole change is, is taking place, but we both understand the effects of it quite closely now that we've we've had somebody who works near us pass away we understand close you know that it, that the effects of the joe diffie i mean we this is how we got into right country music yesterday we were talking about joe right, diffie right. who i think was not v- very old 66 67 but coronavirus right 
And so we understand we understand the effects this has, but we, you know, in in doing this little bit for you, we wanted to communicate kind of what it was like for us. Well, and that's it. That's you know, it's uh, it's tough because uh, you're teleworking, you're working, right. other people are working, and uh, you know, you mentioned we did have a death. Uh, when you say close to us on the same installation, right, right. Uh, neither one of us knew him, right. but it happened so fast. It's nearby. He was at work. Right. Yeah, he was at work 10 days ago. Yep. It happened um, fast. It happened the, on a Friday. Di- yeah, yeah Monday, like four days. He called in sick. Mm-hmm. Wednesday, he's in the hospital. Saturday, he's gone. Yeah, it's no joke. So it, it's, it's no joke. All right. So, I mean, we, we do these things, you know, obviously nobody likes to break their routines, Right. Nobody wants to not enjoy the things that they usually enjoy. I'd love to go out to dinner and have schnitzel and do whatever. But right now, play golf, play golf. I mean, we, we were talking about this yesterday, right? We were just really good. I'd literally said, okay, I think I told you this last time we the, the time we were able to get out that one day. I said I, after that, I said, I'm going to keep my clubs in my car because I think the weather's starting to get good. And then, boom, like the next week they yep. closed it. Unbelievable. And then we've had a string of. Just incredible days since then. 60s, near, it's supposed to be near 70 this weekend. It's just crazy. So, yeah, it's been, you know, you break routine, and that's just the way it is. What else you want to talk about? Well, you know, you, we, we talked a little bit about this, uh, and this morning I found out, I mentioned before, I'm diabetic. Right. Uh, I've been diabetic, type 1 diabetic, <laughs> I keep wanting to say type 1 diabetes, for 34 years in April. And today it came back to bite me and I'm not blaming anybody. So let me make sure I say that right off the bat. It's the smart choice for me uh, to stay home because quite frankly, I am in that higher percentage of people who may get it because I'm compromised right. due to diabetes. Right. Uh, so the boss uh, uh, contacted me and said, based on what the, the commander's uh, saying he wants anybody who can be compromised to stay home and telework. Yeah. That's A, for that person. So in my case, it's to protect me. And I appreciate that. I can appreciate that. I accept that uh, threat, if you will, uh, that I could get sick. Right. But it also protects people like Jason and my other coworkers who, if I do get sick, and I mean, as we've seen through this whole two month period, right. if I get sick, I may not know it right away. You know, it could present as allergies, right? Or you know, a, a bad cold. Now I've infected my coworkers, whom I really like, and he really likes us. By the way, he wouldn't really like to infect us. That's just to be clear. Okay, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly right. I, you know, oh, yeah. I, I couldn't live with myself if I infected my coworkers, who then may take it home. And like you have a, a daughter, the boss has young children, right? Uh, you know, and uh, uh, there's a spouse, and it was somebody else. So God forbid that something I did infected them. So while I'm incredibly pissed off that I'm in this situation. You're pissed off. You're passionate. Into work. You're passionate about the situation, Keith. I am passionate there about is. the situation. Passionate. Yes. You're so passionate. You want to do I, your part. Yeah, I, I want to be in working with this incredible team that right. I work with. Right. I understand that I probably shouldn't be just because I may go in where I've taken all the precautions, but some other asshole who says it doesn't apply to him sneezes on me. Right. Or sneezes on the counter, right. you know, at the BX or that's something, so, or the commissary. Inevitably, or the, the way zebra it goes. cakes, right. you know, or it goes and, and uh, frolics at a beach, or does something else because they feel it's their right to do, despite this fact that this thing's going to kill maybe a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people. Yeah, exactly. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So that mindset. And then, yeah. So me taking it into the office, what to me, this, despite what I may be going through right. at that time with with the disease. If I was to take it in and infect the people that I, I really care about within the office, devastate me. So while I am passionate that I, I feel like I can be in mm. working in the office, I get it that I probably shouldn't be when I'm susceptible with diabetes. So right. there you have it. 
we were talking yesterday about Joe Diffie dying uh, from coronavirus, and that led us into a discussion of, okay, so there are a ton of Oklahomans who are country stars, and we Keith and I named a few at the start. And we were then we were just trying to name, um, so we like Garth Brooks, Toby Keith. And then we, so we got through the Oklahoma roll call and then it was, okay, who were the sort of nineties country stars, right? And so I had named the ones that I remember the most were Clint Black. And now that these aren't from Oklahoma, but we were just at this point, we were just sort of killing time. Dropping names. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Dropping names. So I, the the ones that I remember, and and, and I should caveat this by saying uh, this all sort of, I didn't remember. Okay. Now I remember it was because you and I are the only ones on our freaking hall right now. Right. So, and our boss is working opposite days of us. And so Keith, I like to listen to my music. Keith likes to listen to his music. So I didn't have mine on. I'm sort of listening to Keith as it's going on, but I couldn't recognize the country star. So I just sort of put two and two together and thought, oh, he must be listening to Joe Diffie. So when he came over to to chat, I said, oh, you're listening to Joe Diffie. No, okay, he was from Oklahoma. Boom. So this is a, that's how this all sort of got us to this conversation. Over you. I'm not a country music fan at all. I mean, not at all. A very little. There's very like there's some George Strait songs I like and a few others. But um, aside from that, um, just a few that we were talking about that sort of picked up speed in the '90s. So we said Clint Black, right? Dwight Yoakam, right. Shania Twain. Shania Twain. That was a biggie. Yeah, and her producer husband Mutt Lang, Leanne Rimes. Oh, she was '80s though. And we no, said Rand, we said Rand, 90s, Randy yeah. Travis was '80s, right? Right. Right. I mean, I've got the I've got a list in front of me, but I'm trying not to look at it as we're Trace about Atkins. Yesterday. I think we said it's. Uh, well, go oh, ahead. God. Just just mention the list. Go ahead. Because uh, I'm going to be I'll fumbling. Skip around. John Michael Montgomery. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, I love the way you. Love Vince me. Gill. Uh, Vince Gill was the number one. Vince Gill. Right. Vince Gill. Right. Um. Well, we both, and this goes back to before the 90s, but, right. uh, and she's still just one album of the year, Tanya Tucker. <laughs> That's so uh, weird. And, like, she does that, like, every decade. Like, she'll go, <laughs> she'll go clandestine for, like, eight years, and then at the end of the decade, she'll pop up, and it's like, boom, country music artist of the year again, and then, poof, go undercover again. And then the 90s, right. boom, country music artist of the year, album of the year, boom, go undercover again. It's like, how, you know, how old is she? She's been around, my mother was listening to Tanya Tucker, as I recall. As far, I remember her coming in in, like, the six, 68 or 69 or 70, that time of year, so. Kenny Chesney started off in the 90s. You know, that, like you said, you brought this up, that whole that whole late 80s, early 90s Kenny Chesney. Group I thought Chesney. he was much later than Garth that. I thought he was like 2000s. Yeah, Chesney started, uh, oh, Patty Loveless, Kathy Matea, uh, Mark Chestnut, Tracy Bird. Oh, Lord. Billy Ray Cyrus. Billy Ray Cyrus. That's the one. Billy Ray Cyrus he, and his hit. I'll give him two because there's a What's song the called one? Some Gave All. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was real popular. really good. Alan yeah, Jackson. Really that good. was the Alan Jackson was the other one that I kind of... Alan Jackson. Yep. Trace Atkins, uh, I think I said. Um, Trace? Sawyer Brown was a band. Trisha Yearwood. Because we were... We, we kind of right. rattled through the men's names pretty quickly, and I felt bad. I'm like, well, there were other women aside from Shania Twain. So it was Trisha Yearwood. Faith Hill. We got her pretty quick. And right. then she went on to, uh, of course, Monday Night Football fame, right? Absolutely. Um, Terry Clark. Terry Where Clark from Alberta, Canada. Terry Clark. Yes. Yes. I, uh, let's see. Who else? If we're talking women... Uh, as I said, Martina McBride. Martina McBride. Uh, Reba McIntyre, as you said, has always been well, consistent. Reba, yeah. Yeah. Even in the early 90s, still Tammy Wynette, mm-hmm. believe it or not. That's, she was still around. I didn't realize that. I think yeah. George Jones the, was still yeah. alive. But that, and see, that was another thing we got into was I had said it, that that's when country music sort of started to make a shift. And it was a purposeful shift, I think, because pop music was dying. At least, you know, the music companies or the music record companies themselves were dying. And the sort of old guard of pop music and um, other things was, you know, the, the money was starting to slip away from it, but it wasn't slipping away from Memphis and Nashville. So to me, it seemed like they just sort of sucked in the best of pop and rock and other things. And that sort of became country music from like 1996 on. I mean, it's not to say there still aren't good country artists, but you just don't hear, I shouldn't say that. That just means I'm old. There are big, bigger differences between the Chris Ledoux's, the Dwight Yoakam's, the George Straits, the George Joneses, the uh, Charlie Prides, the Hank Williams Juniors of the world. The Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers. Then there are, say, of the, uh, I can't even name a modern country artist, but 
Kenny Chesney comes to mind, although I know he's well liked. Um, but I, I always thought Kenny Chesney was kind of like Jimmy Buffett in a cowboy hat. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not wrong. Okay, you're not wrong. Well, and, I, and I don't have a problem with that. It's just you know that that's that's what that is. So I, that's when I noticed. And I'm not again. I'm not again. I'm, I'm not necessarily a country music fan. So I'm not decrying it, and I'm not praising it. I'm just saying this is an observation that I saw anyway. But so when we're talking about all these names, that the I started. That's when we got into the conversation of okay, what are the generations? And then you were correcting me because I kept starting saying some names. You're like, no, that's more two thousands. And the deal is, I was in radio playing country music in 1992. Oh, so right. for for three years in well, Altus, Oklahoma, Leanne Rhymes uh, is still big K-W- then because I was playing some country. Uh, I was playing yeah. some of her songs on the AM radio station that I worked at too. Winona Judd, and then the Judd, or the Judd, right. then Winona, yeah. You know, and I'm looking through this list, and I'm looking at, at people like uh, Lila McCann and uh, uh, Minnie, Minnie McCready. I can't remember oh, the yeah. song, but I can remember what she looks like. Uh, Confederate Railroad, Billy oh, Dean. Oh, Confederate Railroad, I forgot about them. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, there's just, there's a lot of them that didn't have uh, a lot of hits, but they had some hits that... If you heard it come on the radio, you go, "Oh yeah, right." You know, and, exactly. and I'll even do you one better. Like Restless Heart. You Turn mentioned Restless Heart started, yesterday. Turn started in the mid to late '80s when this little group called Alabama, Alabama. came yeah. around, yep. and they started with the guitars and the and the harmony and the you know the the half shirts that were popular back in the 80s that we all used to wear Mm -hmm. and uh you know and they were just they just threw classic country on its ear right so when people like that group we were talking about like the garths the the alan jacksons and and uh you know the bridge of george Strait, who who got a big popular following even though he was more classic country you know that started everything Randy Travis, you know, that's Randy Travis. Uh, so it's, uh, so we, we kind of need to wrap up. We've only got a couple minutes left, but so Randy Travis to me was, is interesting because I felt like that's where there was a country music tipping point, if you will, where when he had his success, he would, to me was a very big crossover because I, that's when I knew, that's when I started learning a lot about country music. And that's actually when I first bought my first country music, um, Cassettes uh, to uh, <laughs> listen to, which was Hank, w- Hank Williams Jr. Um, and that was um, what was the song back then? They called him crazy. Nowadays they call him a saint. That song. I bought that cassette. I bought a Merle Haggard. So I so I I had some country music, but to me, Randy Travis sort of signified that tipping point between country music and pop. And that's to me is when country music as an industry really. Launch. So I I put that around, excuse me, that's probably around 87, 88, 89. It was right when I joined the Air Force. It had to be right around then. All right, I think we're done for this time around. Do you think we're done? I can be done if you can be done, or I can keep talking. You tell me. (laughs) We'll keep it at an hour for now, and then we'll decide if we need to talk more. All right, fine. Um, So this podcast should be, after I do all of the things that need to be done, available on uh, iTunes, uh, Sprecher, um, Spotify, Google Play, and elsewhere. So if you need to listen to us again, you can find it there. Uh, you should also be able to find it on my website, jasontutor.com, as soon as I'm able to put it all together. We thank you for listening to the inaugural Still Untitled podcast, and hopefully by the next episode, which will probably be next week, we will have a new episode. Say bye, Keith. Thank you for breaking my podcast cherry. I it was... <laughs> oh. it was it well, was gentle. Thank you. I think we have to go spoon now. See you later, everybody. <laughs>